Hey everybody, on Chess Today today I'm going to discuss whether or not the only thing more overused than an often obnoxious and inappropriate chess reference uh, in a sports game is the political references being made now as to which politicians are actually playing chess while the others are playing checkers. First of all, checkers isn't even in the same league as chess. Can we at least clarify that? Maybe Nattel can start separating those board games. One game has 140,000 total possibilities being checkers. The other one starts with over 1.4 billion possibilities and don't even get me started on chess 960. So the fact that it's even made as a comparison, a little disrespectful to our game, but a fun one with an article published by the New York Times discusses whether Donald Trump is truly a chess master and uh, playing a game that other people are not. I'll let everybody else weigh in on the chat and give their own opinions on this political topic that we don't swim into very often. But first and foremost, as you know, before we do anything else, it is, of course, time for the Daily Puzzle. So let's, uh, let's move back away from our, our Trump discussion and go get solving. Chess comes first on the Chess Today show. And here we have a Daily Puzzle that, first sight, I uh, realized that Black actually has no checks. No, he does have bishop to c5 check. Queen A8 check, King to D7, Bishop to E6 check, King to E6. Sorry, Bishop to C6 check, King to E6, Queen to C8 check, King to F7. I'm winning the Bishop, but is that really enough? Let's discuss. Let's figure out another option, maybe. Uh, one option is Queen A6 check first, with the difference being that if he plays King to D7, I have Knight C5 check. If he takes it, I win the Queen. No, I don't, because he takes on C5 with check. So let's see here. Um, Queen a8 check, king to d7, queen into c6 check is certainly possible. There, if he plays king to e6, we can play queen to d5 check, king back to d7, knight to c5 check. The king runs away again. And again, I'm failing to see. I mean, there's queen g8, queen f8, and then bishop c6 check there. For some reason, I'm failing to see exactly what the uh, most obvious forcing continuation is here. Uh... Diagonal play. That's a fun little fun little title for our daily puzzle. I love the cute little titles we have, right? Diagonal play. Um, sounds like child's play. All work and no play makes Dan a dull boy, right? Um, who am I kidding, though? My, my work is play. Bishop to c6. Doesn't work as a bishop c5 check. If we're eliminating, if we're eliminating the possibility of... Of... Uh, of any passive move that isn't a check, then I have to be more forcing. One idea is queen g8 check, which I didn't really consider right away. Obviously, he can't block, and if he plays king to d7, is there some sort of concrete follow-up? Queen g8 check, king to d7. I, I don't see it. Bishop c6 check, he takes it. Queen a8 check, king goes back. I got nothing. So, okay, I'm back to either queen a8 or queen a6 check. If queen a8 check, king to d7... Bishop c6 check. King to e6 is the only move. I can then play bishop to d5 check. He can play, if the king goes back to d7, he can also play king of 5. If king of 5, queen c8 check, king to g6, bishop e4. Wow, why is there, nothing is popping out at me in this position. Our daily puzzles have gotten harder. I'm telling you, they're harder than they used to be. I don't even know if that's a good idea. I might need to talk to my team about that. Not because I don't enjoy, you know, stressing over a daily puzzle in your presence, but because <laughs> I don't know that if, if I'm struggling with this, even if it's, even if it's just because of uh, lack of coffee morning Dan, um, I'm sure that others are as well. Oh, wait. If bishop c6, bishop c5 check, and knight takes c5, queen takes... Okay, there is no mate. Okay, for a second I thought maybe there was mate with queen g8 or queen a8 check. Okay, so no. Um, queen a6 check, king to d... It seems wrong to give him that option because, because I don't see a reason why king to d8 is much worse than, than king d7. So I feel like queen a6 check should be the move by process of elimination. King to d7... Queen to c6 check, king to d8. I don't see a follow-up there. 
I mean, if I go back to a8, he can even play bishop c8 and block it. Bishop b7, he can play queen e6 and guard it. Queen e8 check, king to d7, bishop c6 check, king to e6. I'm starting to get closer and closer to realizing maybe all I have is this queen c8 check, king up, and just gobble up the bishop, huh? But it just it feels like there's just no way that can be right. To play for a, a win of the bishop on h3, as much as you may still have a dangerous attack on the diagonal, it just doesn't feel right. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I have to avoid the chat because I'm sure more people have the answer at this point than I do, right? <laughs> um. This is fun. It's not fun. I don't like not solving it right away. So what's instructive about this? I mean, obviously, you know, this glaring weakness means I still have to put the right move order together, and I'm currently failing in this in this task. Hmm. Why? Why am I struggling with this? What's going on here? Queen a6 check, king d7. No, but again, there, if queen a6, he can also go to d8. So that means I better have something on queen d8 and bishop c8, which I just don't think I do. Bishop b7, he can guard the bishop, and I... So that means queen a6 check is eliminated. Queen a8 check is the move. King to d7. Okay, I'm going to play queen a8 because I know it's the move. Sometimes you can solve a combination by process of elimination. And it's not the most... Um, not the most fulfilling way to solve a combination and seeing it from start to finish. But from a practical perspective, if I was solving this puzzle during like a daily puzzle challenge where I have to solve a whole bunch of puzzles in a row, I would, um, I would probably go with this move and, and see if it got me closer to realizing something that I couldn't see before. Um, if bishop c6 check, king up, queen c8 check, king f7. That's a forcing line, at least. Bishop d5 check, he can block if I take. So I've already established that. If queen c6 check, king to d8. Follow up. I don't see a follow up. So what would be the idea on bishop to c6? If bishop c6, king e6, bishop d5 check. Um... I don't know. Even there, if he goes back to d7, like, what's the deal, right? Is queen a4 check the move? If he goes back to c8, I just, you know, at least, okay, I guess if, if queen d4 check and he goes back to c8, I have bishop c6. But no, he'll go to d8, and I don't see anything spectacular, to say the least. Um... I think I might get this one wrong. I mean, what is today? Today's Tuesday. Wow. I normally never get a puzzle wrong on a Tuesday. Tuesday, right? Um, today's Title Tuesday, by the way. So let's not forget that. We got Title Tuesday coming up at 1 p.m. Pacific today. All right. I, I don't know the answer here. And I feel like it's either super obvious and I'm just, or it's just way. Uh, way tricky. I would probably play bishop c6 check, king e6, and queen c8 check and gobble the bishop if this was a real game. And then I would, you know, be like, well, I've still got kind of a dangerous initiative on the light squares because at this point I just don't see the answer beyond that. Ah, uh, wait. Oh, wow. Okay. Bishop to c6 check. 
the king comes up and the queen comes back to a2, which is why I missed it. Counterintuitive. I almost gave up. So why was I able to solve that? I actually don't even know. Like what, what, what thought process could I explain that actually would help others? First of all, maybe I shouldn't be explaining my thought process given that my thought process was clearly slow today. Uh, but no, seriously, I, I mean, I think that one of the things you have to watch out for is a pitfall of, of like you only look forward, right? You, you're sort of, you know, we, we talk about the checks, captures, tempo moves, right? So you're following these sort of powerful moves in your head. And I, I looked at these along with a million others, queen c6 check, queen a6 check to start. And I, and I was only focused on like forward progress. I was looking at moves like bishop d5 or queen to c8 and moves that seem a little more I guess like in close proximity, and that's a funny thing about the chessboard is when you're operating on the diagonals, the geometry is such that you don't need to be physically close to the king. And so I just like wasn't, I just wasn't seeing queen a2 check. I mean, honestly, if this were a bullet game, this is the kind of move I would miss. Like I would be going forward and, you know, it can be a little counterintuitive to not, um, you know, to not realize that, that uh, what's, it, it does show you that, you know, one of the things we talk about, which again is really hard to execute in practice, I'm always big on establishing the essence of the position first, right? It starts with material. So here white was, you know, down a rook, but had this incredible attack on the light squares. Obviously, all my calculations were focused on the light squares. So it wasn't like it wasn't like I wasn't appreciating the attack on the light squares. But part of the reason you try to like establish big picture stuff first when solving puzzles is because they're not your game. So you're not aware of how the position got there. It's easy to kind of miss things like subtleties, right? And so if you take the time to recognize sort of the essence of the position, where the biggest weaknesses are, uh, maybe, maybe there's a better chance not to miss a move like that. But this was tricky for me. A mate in four that uh, for some reason just one counterintuitive move was something that I almost missed. Again, in hindsight, pretty fun and, and, and sassy to see white operate fully on the diagonals and force that king from c8 up to f5 and, uh, you know, and deliver the bell ringer. But... But okay, there you go. Sorry for that. If uh, Now it's time to check in on the chat with the question I posed to start our Chess Today show, of course, was is there anything more overused uh, when, with, when it comes to chess comparisons than, I guess there's three, right? We're not playing, I'm playing chess while others are playing checkers or, um, or um, you know, it's a game between two chess masters out there talking about coaches and then the moves they're making. And then, you know, then there's the political references and they go as far as to say that maybe, maybe uh, Donald Trump is playing 3d chess while the rest of them are playing regular chess. Uh, you know, I, I just think it's pretty funny to see the political metaphors. First of all, that's just a great picture, right? Spock playing some 3d chess. I'm sure if we looked hard enough, we could see something illegal. Like aren't the Kings just right next to each other here? I don't know, but it's it's fun to uh, fun to see. So check out the New York New York Times article if you have any interest in wondering uh, why they why they why they tend to see or, or where they're actually where they actually see things now. I think in the beginning people were always making jokes about Donald Trump right back when you didn't think he was actually going to win, and now it's like frightening. <laughs> Whether you're a Trump fan or not, the whole world is on the edge of their seat all the time. All right, so enough of that. But uh, all right, let me check in with the chat. Say hi to everybody. Um, the uh, Danny and so Miklo Ping wants to know if I'm a lift driver. No, this is this is power lift. This means the power key lift. It's a it's actually a security. It's a security uh, team firm kind of people that break your website for you and then tell you what you can do to patch your security holes. And they gave me a free T-shirt. Uh, so that's that's what this is right here. Um. BJ, BJH13 says Reddit hated my rant yesterday. That's fun. No, not, not very often that Reddit uh, doesn't like something, right? What, what, uh, you can share the link with me, BJH13. Um, always, always fun to get, to get uh, feedback from Reddit that involves negativity since that's pretty much you know, what you get most of the time. Um, yeah, go ahead and share the link with that. I'll hop into Reddit and see, uh, see what, what people are saying. Um, uh, what else we got here? Uh, Donald Trump is not necessarily much smarter, just much bolder. Okay, yeah, well, I'm not going to debate too much into those, but it was just a fun way to start the Chess Today show with an interesting news topic. By the way, if you're not reading, if you're not reading Mike Klein's news topics, um, if you're not reading Mike Klein's other news reports, he um, 
He does these pretty much once a month, kind of like a roundup of a number of ways or areas that chess has been mentioned in pop culture throughout the month. Um, you know, he gathers things, uh, you know, little little things from from uh, chess references in pop culture to uh, interesting articles. This one was about whether or not, you know, the debate between whether chess makes you smarter or smart people play chess, right? Always interesting when you dive into Freakonomics and wonder what the real story is behind whether chess makes people smarter. Um, and, you know, he just, he just does a, a really fun roundup. So if you're interested in just like the chess world and how it's seen or kind of the global presence of chess in culture, um, the, uh, the Mike Klein's roundups are just a ton of fun. And, um, I, I enjoy reading them cause, um, uh, just gives you a chance to maybe take a slightly less serious look at the chess world. And for those who, uh, you know, many people aren't just like automatically following the grand chess tour, right? At least, uh, not right away, but so interesting stuff by Mike. I encourage everybody to check out that one. And that's where I got the, uh, the topic and the question of whether or not political references were even more overused than, um, um, then, uh, then sports references. There you go. BJ, BJ shares the, uh, shares the link with me. I'll, uh, I'll open that and check that out later. Um, the, uh, chess Bay 94 wants to know if I saw the, uh, the upside down. Yeah. I, I didn't get to finish this article here by Mike, um, uh, on the, on the controversial ending here. So I didn't know exactly where to dive into on that topic, but it looks like, Looks like that we had a really interesting finish there um, with the uh, with a blitz playoff that went down between a couple of pretty strong Canadian players. Of course, to me, the only highlight of the article is seeing our boy right there, you know, Mr. Beard himself, Amon Hamilton playing at the Canadian Open. Right. I love it. I mean, just like what do we how many days rest do you think he's on right there? Like one out of the last week? I mean, look, is it are his is he sleepwalking? Right. I mean, uh I, it's it's classic Amon Hamilton. We can say that. So just uh, just loving the look, loving the beard, loving the chest bra. So anyway, yeah, check out check out the article there. Those are the news topics today. Maybe not quite as interesting as our awesome Photoshop contest yesterday from the ending of the Leuven Leuven Grand Chess Tour. But um, the uh, let's see, uh, Dre Dre eighty three forty seven wants to know in light of the picture with Ashley, do you think Carlson's response in the interview was warranted? I'm not exactly what interview. I mean, are you talking about the interview where they went at it? But this picture was taken after the interview. So I'm not exactly sure on the timeline there. Um, so one, one thing I want to answer, I want to say hi to everyone in the chess TV chat as well. Not ignoring you guys, GM wannabe, Benjen 1211, Tom Harper, everybody. Thanks for being here. Welcome again to the chess today show. So I want to, I want to answer this question here by, um, by, um, uh, Q, Q Tunneler, who, who wants to know whether it's, whether it's better. I, I told him to come back the next day and pose the question, and he did that. So before we dive into my daily chess games, we're going to do what we try to do on this show, which is give you guys a little bit of coaching if we have a chance. So let's open up an analysis board, um, and uh, we'll even make it a broadcast, and we'll just say, you know, chess today, and we'll start an analysis board here. So Q Tunler's question that he asked toward the end of the show yesterday that I miss is he said he's finding in speed chess it's better to just go for something quickly, uh, a, a simple setup, one that you can sort of control. We'll call it a system, right? A system is something that, okay, all openings are technically a system, but we use this term system openings to describe someone who's basically trying to play the same setup regardless of what their opponent plays, right? And so he mentions the London system as a, as a system that he tries to use for this. There are others, right? So like the London system, for those of you who don't know, is white plays d4, and then whether black plays knight f6, d5, e6, really, g6, see, it goes on and on, doesn't really matter. White is probably going to play knight f3 next, and then on pretty much no matter what black does, you know, D6, D5, E6, G6, um, short of probably C5. C5 is actually the opening I play, just FYI. It's something I like to play against those who are sort of setting themselves up for a London because it is a little more challenging. Now white can't just play bishop f4 because you will immediately capture and have won the center pawn. So, okay, C5 has risk that it draws. It, it, it allows this option for like a Bononi type structure. So if I'm playing somebody who really knows their theory, sometimes I get in trouble with this line, um, but I won't get into all that now. So that's one thing I try to do to throw a London system player out of their system. But let's say for the most part, 
people, if they're playing a Nimzo, a King's Indian, a Slav, white gets to play bishop before. So first of all, for those who don't even know the context of the question, I've at least answered that. This is the London system, and this is what he means, Mr. Q Tunler on Twitch. So he wants to know if this is an if this is a good idea, if it's an advantageous idea, because I went on a long rant about whether it was good to just play openings that you don't really normally play in Blitz or Bullet, because, hey, it's Blitz or Bullet. And I, my point was that really not only is that a waste of time, you limit any instruction you could possibly get out of Blitz or Bullet, which I think there are sometimes small opportunities to really learn some things. But, you know, you, you're often getting yourself in bad positions, and then any any lesson you would get from the middle game is irrelevant to your chess, because you're never going to reach that middle game position in an over-the-board tournament, because you played an opening that you're never going to play again. You see what I'm saying? So try to play systems that you that you actually want to get. So my answer, first, the first answer to that, Q Tunler, would be the London system is not a bad opening. And so to me, if you're going to be playing a London system in Blitz and getting a ton of experience in that, why not adopt it as one of your main weapons over the board? If you're doing that and you're taking the time to really learn the London system, you know, if we talk about, you know, let's say you... Uh, you get my boy, you know, Cyrus Lakdawalla's book on playing the London system. Great book. You know, let's say you actually model yourself after some of the top players who play the London system, Dimitri Andraken. If you're actually learning the system, then, yeah, not only can it be advantageous to play it in Blitz, because, yeah, it is faster, yeah, and you do get to play it pretty much on no matter what they play, so it, it does help speed things up on your point. But also, it's it, that experience being gained, again, in Blitz and Bullet, is helping you for over-the-board chess. If you're playing the London system just in Blitzer Bullet, and then, you know, over the board you're playing, let's just make it exaggerated to prove the point, E4, then I don't really agree. I mean, to me, uh, again, I, I do believe that what you can pull out of Blitzer Bullet can be beneficial if you actually make the effort to do it. Um, not in every stage of the game. You're not holding yourself to, you know, a high level of non-blunder, you know, blunder-free chess. I think that's where probably a lot of people on Reddit didn't understand my point as I'm sort of quickly reviewing the comments and talking to you at the same time. Hashtag multitasking master. Um, but, you know, so if you're playing something totally different, I, then, I, then I don't really agree. I mean, I, I would just play your regular stuff. But okay, like, yeah, I mean, I, I, played, I played like a Verisoft right, D4 and this move, and of course I would break my own rule there, I'm playing a Verisoft opening, you know, even though I play E4, I guess, in over-the-board tournaments, and, you know, I guess the way I would say that is, one, yes, there are some openings like systems, like a, like a London or a Verisoft, where again, no matter what white, black does, I'm playing Bishop E4, Bishop G5, what's another system, like a King's Indian attack, even though people don't always think about, it, like, this is sort of theoretically a system, right, oops, not that, <laughs> No matter what black does, you're going to like basically play these as like your first five moves, right? The King's Indian attack. That's also a system. And your idea is that you're going to play that no matter what, no matter what they do. And so, you know, I think, um, I think if you're going to play a system and really get good at those positions, you can make blitz more beneficial for your over the board chess than old school chess masters and thinkers would say. That's my point. And, and, um, you know, so I would say commit to a system if you like it. If you're playing a system just for Blitz and Bullet, usually stronger players do that, but, but you know, they've spent a lot of time knowing chess, and, and so Dimitri Andreykin doesn't only play the London system over the board, but it is something he goes back to from time to time. So it's like a yes and no. It makes sense, and there are some advantages to being a system player in Blitz. Overall, if you're still like a growing chess player, a 1600, 1800, if you're still a growing boy, you know, and you need to eat your, your protein, I would say that the more time you can spend playing systems and structures that you plan on playing in your most serious environments, the better. So there you go. That's how, hopefully that answers your question, Q Tunnler. Um, your follow-up question is, would you tend to use an unlimited repertoire on less digging in speed, unless digging into a certain variation? Otherwise, can't seem to chat on chess.com, so that's why I'm here. I don't know why you can't chat on chess.com, Q Tunnler, unless you were a bad boy and got muted. That might be your own problem. I don't know. But otherwise, any, any basic member can chat on chess.com. So, um, including all those spamming me behind me for challenges and trying to get me to accept it. So your question is, um, would you use an unlimited repertoire? I mean, unlimited repertoires, that's a vague thing. Like with young players, I'll continue to offer chess advice here today. So let's say with young players, the reason why we don't always recommend that they play in English or a Catalan is because... It, depending on what happens in these systems, somebody may challenge you where the best opportunity is to transpose back into a mainline Catalan. Or if, you know, 
if they play like a, a King's Indian, you know, maybe the best thing to do is to go back into the main line and play the most challenging theory or something. I don't know. You end up having to know a lot more than just like your one little opening move order. So, um, you know, that's like uh, the reason I thought of that is because the way you phrased your question about would you play an unlimited repertoire. I think the more the more time you spend in openings, if you're not a master, the more you can be hurting yourself overall. Like when I talked about these study plans, you know, part of my point was that, you know, when, you, when, you're, when you're actually developing like a study plan and trying to get better, you don't want to spend all your time on openings. So my issue with, with the way people approach openings often is that, especially weaker players, they tend to become obsessed with the fact that the opening is the reason they're winning or losing games. And they like that idea because it's the area where they feel they have the most control over or they can place blame to. You know, and, and so they just decide they don't like a position anymore. When very often, almost every opening, unless you're playing something really crappy, has been played by the best players in the world. So really, it's your own lack of commitment or understanding and lack of experience that is losing the middle games. So if you're bouncing around all the time, all you're doing is is playing positions where like you have to learn more openings and therefore spend more time there that you could be spending in middle games or end games, things that are actually affecting the result of the game. Or or you're, you know, constantly reinventing the wheel and, and convincing yourself that, you know, just a new opening is going to help you get over the top. So I, I, that's why, again, I'm a big fan of until you reach like a master level, commit to a repertoire, like play something as white. Um, E4 or D4, and then learn a, learn what you want to do against each one of blacks. Like, play something as white. Play something against D4, play something against E4, and whatever you choose against D4, that should be your opening against C4, Knight F3. Or at least you should try to reach a similar structure. Just commit to this, and then go for it, and, and, and spend as much of your time as you can in other areas of the game, and it's much more likely that you're going to show real improvement in that with that sort of strategy. That's kind of my point on that on that rant and why why I talk about using Blitz and Bullet as a chance to get more experience in those openings. Again, despite despite Reddit's negative negative spin. I think I think they like having negative spins on most things I say. Um, but uh, but yeah, so that would be my that would be my advice on that. A lot of other questions coming in. Um, but uh, Oh, it was a limited repertoire. Okay. Yeah, I mean, again, I like that. Yes, I'm saying a limited repertoire. That's kind of what I'm a proponent of and, and just because of the experience. And so what, what can happen with that is you actually end up becoming the, you end up getting the opposite and it ends up being even better. So instead of this problem I described where you're bouncing around, blaming the opening when it's really not the opening's fault, hurting your own experience because you're just trying to understand too many structures when you should be diving in to improving other areas of your game. If you commit to like, you know, an approach Often, what ends up happening is one, you spend less time studying all the openings, so you're actually getting better in the other areas, you know, end games, middle games, like I'm saying. But actually, over time, you'll be even better in the opening than probably you really are as a chess player. Like, I played people who, like, have just played so many London systems where, you know, they just know those positions. Like, they probably play those positions at a master level, even if they're only an expert level chess player. You know, so you can actually have the opposite thing happen and really get good at a certain position. So that's one advantage of being consistent. And again, using Blitz and Bullet to practice your openings, don't just Remember, this whole rant started because I was critical, uh, just to clarify, I was critical of someone like freaking out and being nervous and just like, you know, oops, the analysis board went away. And, you know, just like, you know, grabbing a piece and moving it, even if they even if they're not a knight of six player, they're a Slav player, right? Or against E4, you know, playing E5 and then just like quickly copying because they're playing bullet, even if they're, you know, they're, a, you know, they play a standard E4, E5, not a Petrov. That was my point is don't play things that you don't play in Blitz and Bullet. And, and just, you know, it's a, it's a waste of your own potential experience. You're robbing yourself. So, OK, that's that. Let's go and make my daily chess moves as we move on to the uh, the next stage here in uh in why does it do that um as we move on to the next stage here in the chess today show apparently i have a few games so in this one where we left i traded rooks on a2 um currently converting on this end game a uh, good example of principle two weaknesses i guess would be kind of like my technique here first sort of focused on you know ganging up on the queen side pawns and creating more of an opportunity to win with the a pawn and then flipping the script gathering another another pawn and with the rook trade even if you even if i lose one of these pawns i think probably just a simple approach here i should either activate my king or just try to create another pass pawn over here 
but why even play h6 and let him play h5? I think just I think just start to activate the king, and if I end up having to make a decision to go this way, white's not going to be in a position to get everybody in time uh, before even one of those pawns queens, or let alone I create another problem over here. So, so we're going to play king e5. All right, this one is just a um, a matter of technique. Thank you, Mother Russia. As we know, e dog 99 is currently taking me down in this chess 960 affair. Slightly depressing. I, I I played the defensive move to block his e file against my own against my own instincts to completely go nuts. I'm going to pretend like I might actually care about still having some drawing chances in this game. So okay, as we bring the uh, chess today show to a close, let's review the chat one more time. See a question: Am I standing? Yes, I am standing. I'm at a standing desk. In fact, give a quick shout out. This is my new flexi desk. Flexi desk. Say what? Right. You can lift it up and down. So instead of only being at a standing desk, you know, you want that to be ergonomic at your wrist level, uh, I can also sit down, right? So it's not even just like one of those like things where you do the, uh, the funny thing where you're like, right? Classic, classic chair, uh, classic stairs. Um, yeah, so I have a standing desk. It's pretty fun, pretty cool. I like it. Um, I agree with Q Tundler. Uh, Silman's complete endgame course is very good. The pink, the pink Silman endgame book, the first one, Essential Chess Endings by Jeremy Silman is phenomenal. Uh, in the beginning, get things like um, Endgame Virtuoso by Smizloff, um, Practical Chess Endings by Paul Carries. Get endgame books that teach you things. Avoid avoid getting endgame books like this at first. You know, like. Like, just like the manual. This is a great one by Mueller, so I'm not... But it's basically just like a list of positions that you should probably treat more as like an encyclopedia if you get a rook ending and you want to look it up. Um, but this is a great... Like, speaking of endgame books that will teach you stuff, this one, How to Play Chess Endings, again, by Mueller. Um, these, this, is a, this is also a complicated kind of advanced book, but it's much more practical in nature. Sets up an endgame position, you know, talks about the themes and kind of breaks it down by king activity and, you know... Creating a pass pawn and uh, you know all the things in the endgame. So that's my recommendation for endgame books at first, before you just get encyclopedias and tell yourself I'm going to work myself through the entire Divoretsky endgame manual and like it sounds really great. And you get into it and you're like, holy bleep! Like this is really hard. Endgames really suck. Rook endings are tough. Don't do that. You know that's my point. And it, it gets really hard. So um, Abhishek says Chess.com is amazing. Thank you, sir. Um, anyway. Chess TV chat, how's it going, peeps? Yeah, he has the, yeah, dancer, uh, Plectorama Diamond member. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, he does have his reassessed chess series in the beginner's mind degree, but he also has these essential chess endings books are not as popular as his reassess your chess, but I, I think it's a great book. Um, uh, old chess dog is laughing at me. He says that's what he did, but he found he likes Divoresky. That's fine to each his own. I, I think that those things can be really tough to work through. And until you understand some of the practical aspects of how to calculate and approach endings, um, some of the things that we talk about that sound a little more vague versus just what the computer's evaluation of an endgame is, I, I think sometimes those things can be really hard. But okay, if you if you're if you're uh, tackling Divoresky's endgames, then you're you're a beast, and I, I salute you for that, old chess dog. Um, Danny, is the middle game more important than the end game? No. No, I mean, there's no more important in chess. Chess can't be compartmentalized like a lot of our brains want it to be. The whole thing is full. But if I actually had to recommend an approach, I would recommend end games before anything else, the Russian method, backwards to forwards thinking. Know your goals and positions so that when you're playing a middle game, you actually know, oh, this trade goes into a winning rook and pawn ending. Oh, this one doesn't. You know, th that's the kind of thing that you are only going to know with a good knowledge of, of some technical rook ending or some technical end game positions where you just know king and pawn endings like this are winning and these ones aren't, right? If you can add some knowledge like that into your database, it allows you to make higher level decisions in more complicated sets of material like, like middle games. So I, if I had to vote, I would say the end game is more important than any other stage, actually, to master first. Uh, but unfortunately, because we all want to play, we don't just want to be robots, you got to learn openings too. So really, what ends up being a practical advice is you kind of end up, as a coach, telling people, look, pick an opening repertoire, stick with it. Do tactics every day. Tactical pattern recognition is really the most important part of the middle game for a long time. 
and study your end games. If I had to be like three things, like I would say end games should get the first real decent amount of your time in terms of the love you want to give to getting better at chess and then and then back up and, and maybe um, add a little more of a complex opening repertoire, uh, you know, improve your middle game knowledge with more strategical pawn structure, positional chess type stuff. You know, I, I, again, this is a very, very vague description, but if I had to vote, I lean toward the Russian method, end games before everything else. Master the end game and you will make better decisions with the rest of your life. Um, all right, we're done. This has been a really fun chess today show. Really interactive. Thanks for all the questions. Been a lot of fun as usual. I'm disappointed uh, in Reddit's and Reddit's uh, response to my to my rant. BJ, maybe you could post my uh, my rant from today to clarify that. Give them give them a little more clarity on on where I'm coming from about that. Um, am I going to play Title Tuesday? First of all, Night All Nighty, thanks for subscribing on Twitch. Love that. Um, I'm probably not going to play the Title Tuesday. I got some different meetings going on. I will be online watching other players like Nakamura and others dominate. Um, I'm pretty sure one of the chess bras is providing our coverage. So I'll be around, likely not going to find the time to play. Uh, then I got to bounce a little early, taking the kids to some fireworks, right? Is there going to be anything more torturous? I swear to God, doing the 4th of July is like women having more than one child, right? If, the, if human beings didn't have the ability to forget, we would never do certain things again, right? Like the most, the most powerful skill or most important, you know, call it a gift or a curse, is our ability to forget things, right? Fourth of July is the most torture ever. Like we go to this park, we got to get there early enough to get good seating, right? And, and it's hot and the kids are dying and they want to buy every freaking thing there. They want ice cream and popsicles and it's just like, ah, right? You want to shoot yourself. Then you finally get to the fireworks, which by the way, in the summer, it doesn't get dark till like 9.30, 10, right? So you get to the fireworks super late and then you spend an hour and a half trying to get back to the car and being tortured because parking is insane. Then when you're in the car, you spend a half an hour trying to drive five minutes, right, to get home. I mean, literally, it makes no sense to do this. I would rather pay for like a family vacation and us go to like a hotel and it, like I would rather do anything else with my family, but I can't miss fireworks. Kids want to see fireworks, right? But again, so we're going to do this today because we haven't done it in two years. The last two years, you'd be awesome. You'd be, you'd be proud of me. I got the kids to go up to a hilltop, no traffic, and we could barely see the fireworks, but I loved it. The, the year before that, we traveled and we were, uh, we were on a boat on a lake. So this is like our, we've missed fireworks. So now we got to go to the park and do it. And I swear, I told my wife, I was like, honey, this is, this is why you have more than one child, because you have the ability to forget how much torture you went through. And so you're going to do it again. You know, it's just crazy. That's what we're going to do today. So happy 4th of July um, to everybody who gives a bleep about that in the U.S. If you're, if you're, you know, if you don't care about independence of any kind, that's awesome, too. I mean, hashtag trying to sound politically correct, and he knows he's not. Um, good way to end the show. Thanks, everybody. Been a lot of fun. Appreciate it. Um, and uh, we will we will catch you later. Peace out.